Good morning again, church. It is so good to see you. I want to say a special hello to all those who are joining us online on this weekend. We're grateful that you could connect with us up as well. Anybody who has a Bible or a Bible app on them, Judges chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. We're going to be wrapping up our series called Fierce. But before we dove in, you know, we've been looking at pictures of fierce over these last several weeks, specifically fierce faith. But I wanted to show you, this kind of came across my social media feed uh, this weekend, and it connects to us in a very personal way here at Northview. This is the fiercest picture that I saw all weekend long. That is our fearless leader, Brian Clark, our student pastor at CIY with our middle schoolers. Uh, There was a dodgeball tournament. Our team colors were yellow, and Brian took that mandate to, as he would say, a whole nother level. And uh, he's kind of got Coach Yellow going on here uh, with us today. And so he was in his game mode, okay? So Northview made it to the championship in this this dodgeball tournament. And so Coach Golden here had a pep talk. I want to show you this next picture. This shows you his pregame speech. You want to tell me that this didn't mean anything? This guy was giving it his all. I don't know if they're ready to take Sparta or ready to play dodgeball, but uh, he was giving it this all this weekend, and that was my favorite fierce picture of the weekend. You know, often when we think of fierce, that's what we think of, right? It's some big, strong, muscular, bearded man yelling and screaming and, and, and kind of doing his best to just by brute strength overpower. That's often what we think about when we think about fierce, someone being fierce. But in this series, we've been looking at some very different pictures of what fierce looks like, some very feminine pictures of fierce, some faith pictures of of, of women who, who were used by God, whether it be like in their worship or in their obedience or maybe in their teaching or training of others to show a snapshot to the world to say that is what exemplary faith looks like. And I'm so grateful for some of these feminine pictures of fierce faith that exists in the Bible, right? Now, today we're going to look at one that connects on a leadership level. This is one of my favorite leaders in the Bible. Her name is Deborah, and her story is told in the book of Judges. She was a leader in 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 a world that was dominated by men, and yet God used her undeniably to be to be used powerfully and to help turn the nation of Israel uh, from a from a dark moment into a moment of great great victory and I'm so grateful her stories in the Bible I want to talk about her in a minute but let me kind of set the stage a little bit for her whole moment in history. Anytime we've been bouncing around New Testament Old Testament all over the place with some of these stories in this series called fierce. We're in the Old Testament. Let me set the stage just a little bit, okay? This era called the Judges, 300 and some years uh, long. It's an era where we're after the deliverance from Egypt. So if you remember some of your Old Testament history, Israelites are stuck in Egypt. They're being enslaved. Moses comes in, says, God told me to tell you, let my people go. And finally, after all the plagues, God's people get to go and they cross the Red Sea, remember? And then they, they get out into the wilderness and then they wander and wander and wander in the wilderness, and then finally 40 years go by, and then Joshua succeeds Moses, and he leads the nation, uh, Joshua and Caleb, into uh, the promised land. So at the time of this story, we're now in the promised land, okay? We've been delivered. We're into this place that God had promised Abraham, that he would promised Moses. Uh, this, they're there. They're in that land. They're delivered from slavery in Egypt. They're in the promised land. They've got God's presence now with them. He's dwelling with them in a very tangible way. They've got this tabernacle thing where they can connect and kind of worship God uh, there. They have God's law. So the Ten Commandments have been written and uh, given to the people. 
So they know now God's standards. He's showing the, the, them that they are his people. He's using them as a, as a way to show the whole world, this is who I am. I'm going to choose a people, and I'm going to deal specifically with them so that the whole world can see that of all the nations and in all the nations' uh, beliefs of God, this is the one true God. He's given them his word. He's given his commandments. He's even given them uh, a system of sacrifices, which is helpful because God speaks his commands, but then we screw it up. And so uh, there's got to be a way of atonement or a way of forgiveness, a way of making things right. All of that is in place. All that's set up up into the time of the judges. But as you step into this era, you find that there's a couple things that go wrong real quick. And this is what sets the stage for this entire era. Number one, when they got into the promised land, God told his people, you are to drive out the inhabitants completely from the land completely, okay? Don't, don't stop short of this. Don't, uh, don't back off from this. Completely drive them out. Well, Israel doesn't do that. I mean, they definitely take the land, but they do not ensure that every last uh, inhabitant of the area is, is pushed out. So this is a great, great, there's a great metaphor and great lesson here about sin and how you, you have to get it completely, you got to get it completely out. They don't do it, and it comes back to haunt them. Second thing is, is the generation of parents that enters into the promised land, they do not pass on the faith from one generation to the next. They don't hand it down. So the combination of not driving out everybody that was in the land and adapting to some of their gods instead, and then not passing on the faith intentionally will go down in history as one of two of the gravest mistakes that they made. And it sets up this whole season of, of challenge. Now, God, thankfully, he doesn't give up on his people. He's a good, good God. And he doesn't give up on his people even when they blatantly disobey uh, the things that he speaks to them. He hangs with them. He gives them opportunity. He extends grace to them. But, but what we see in this era of the judges is a cycle that gets repeated over and over and over. At least seven times this exact cycle in the era of the judges gets repeated. And I just want to walk through this with you because it's helpful to understand it both for our lives and also to understand Deborah and her time in history. The first stage is one that we could call rebellion, okay? Stage one is where people forget, the Israelites would forget that we're God's people and he gave us a way to live and he's taught us to stay away from, from sin and from any other, any other gods. It's basically they started violating commandment one and two. No other gods before me and no idols. Slowly but surely, they'd start being pulled away as a nation towards other gods, towards other pursuits. The gods of the Canaanites would become interesting to them, and they'd start pursuing those. There would be this season of rebellion, you know? And so uh, after the rebellion, as they start walking away from God, there would eventually be a reckoning, okay? That's the second part of this. And this is just the way sin goes. You walk down a road for a period of time, and it looks good for a while, but then at some point, it all blows up, and it breaks, it breaks apart on you, right? And so you, you live then in the consequences or the reckoning of all that. I heard a story about a little girl that made a, a mistake. She was like five years old, and she was talking with mom, and mom said, look, here, this is what you chose. You chose the wrong thing, and so now you have to live with the consequences. Any of you parents ever said that? Do now have to live with the consequences. And the girl just broke down in tears, broke down crying. And she said, I don't want to live with the consequences. I want to live with you and dad. But the truth is, is that's just the way it works. You don't get to choose whether you, in fact, you could choose not to live with the consequences, but they come and live with you. They come move in with you. That's the reality, right? That's this reckoning stage. That's where when you choose to walk or run away from God, eventually that road ends in destruction. Romans 1 talks about that, that as you run from God, he'll, event, he'll, he'll let you go. He will let you go down that road, and in the end of that road, you will find great pain and great heartache. That's the reckoning period. Most of the time, this is connected for the nation of Israel to the kind of reckoning from their own failures, their own mistakes, and their own sin. Not anything else, just their own choices. And then it comes home, and they suffer, and they suffer. Many times they were taken captive and enslaved by other people, and God let it all happen. He let it all happen. If you want to run down that road, 
I'll let you run down that road without me, and you'll see where that road goes. And they suffer, and they're in bondage. In this particular situation, ahead of Deborah, 20 years they struggled. For 20 years they lived in that reckoning phase, that rebellion and reckoning phase. But then there's another step in this journey, and this is where it starts to get better. They rebel, they have to live with it, and then they start to repent. In the Hebrew word for repent, it means to return, right? So it makes sense because when you're rebelling against God, you're running from him. And when you repent, you're turning around and coming back to him. It, it's, it's the idea that at some point, the pain becomes so great that you come to your senses and you realize, wait a second, all this started happening when I started running away from God. So I'm going to quit this path. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to return to God. The pain is causing us to learn things. Pain is one of the best teachers that we have, if we're honest. We don't like pain, but we learn from pain. We learn from pain. And then as we learn and as we turn in repentance, there's this moment of or this season of restoration. That's the fourth phase in this, where, where God starts to fix and heal and restore all those broken things that were there. It would, this happens a lot in the book of Judges where it says they would cry out to the Lord and then he would raise up for them a deliverer. And there'd be a deliverance or a restoration period. And there was 12 or depending on how you count, 13 of these different judges that God raised up and restoration happened. And then it would stay good and redeemed and restored usually as long as that judge was alive. And then when they died... Well, we'd reset the process and we'd go back to rebellion and rebellion eventually would lead to reckoning and then pain finally would get great enough that we'd repent and then God would send a deliverer and they would experience this great season of restoration. Deborah is in that cycle and she is one of the people that God sent, one of the judges that God sent to be a deliverer from the nation. Judges 4, chapter 1, or chapter 4, verse 1 says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan. Stop there for a second. The Lord sold them into the hands. That's a scary, that is a frightening verse. But it's actually saying what we just said, that when you choose to run and when you choose to, to, to intend to go as hard as you can away from God, he will allow it to happen. He's when selling him, he's allowing them to, to go down this road. Sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Herosheth Hagim. Because he had 900 chariots fin- fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried out to the Lord for help. 20 years, it took 20 years of pain. 20 years of suffering, but they finally cry out. And as they cry out, they're crying out because they're, in, they're scared for their lives. This, the, this army of, of, of Jabin, led by a guy named Sisera. Jabin's army, Josephus is a uh, first century uh, historian. And he records that Jabin's army was gigantic, like 300,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 in the cavalry. And then he had these iron chariots. We see 900 here in the text. History tells us it was probably north of 3,000. Okay? We're talking a primitive time in history. And to have iron chariots like this, I mean, it's the equivalent of tanks. Okay? And, and you're, you're, you're swinging swords and they have tanks. Right? And, and so major, major advantage to Jabin as far as his armaments, as far as the the kind of things that they had going for them. Now in verse 4, this is where we finally meet Deborah. People are crying out to God, and God sends a deliverer. Here it is. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. This is a significant phrase because it's just so matter of fact. I think there's been a lot of conjecture over the years as to why she was leading. Sometimes it's been said that, well, you know, clearly there were, there were no available men. And so that's why she was, judge, she was in this role as judge because there's no one else like her in the, history, in the history books. 
So there must have been a shortage of men. Or, or maybe there was men available, but they were just delinquent in their activity and in their leadership. And so she had to step up and she was in the void, feeling that void. All I will say about the text is none of that is actually said. It actually says it pretty confidently. She was leading Israel at that time. And it's quite possible that she was leading because she was called, gifted, and put in place to do that very thing by God himself. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible testament to this woman, to her capacity, to her character, and to God's call on her life that she was leading in this way. I mean, to be a judge and a prophet, there's only one other person in the Bible who has those dual uh, qualities, who's given those dual titles. His name was Samuel. You might remember him. He was the one who anointed David king. Special guy in God's, in God's uh, grand story. We saw his name pop up earlier in this series when we were talking about his mother, Hannah. I mean, she's in rare air as a leader. And make no mistake about it, her mark in the Bible is a leadership mark. It is a leadership mark. The Bible tells us of several other prophetesses. Uh, Miriam, Hulda, Anna, and the book of Acts, Philip's daughters are mentioned as that. But again, only Samuel and Deborah are prophet and judge. I think Deborah is simply doing what God called her to do when he called her to do it. She was ready. And when God's people called out for help, she already was his answer for them. It's a fascinating trend to watch whenever you read the Bible is to see that God is never lacking in response time. His readiness is never the issue. He's got answers laying right there, always. It's a matter of the people crying out. They finally do. Deborah is God's in-charge leader. She's his answer even before the cries for help came. She was holding court. It says under this palm tree, um, she's one of the only judges that's listed actually judging, not just uh, as, a, as a warrior, uh, but, but listed actually in court uh, overseeing disputes. So she's very wise. But, but what we're going to see here is that she is also going to step into some really powerful leadership and almost like gladiator type territory here in just a moment. Verse 6, she sent for Barak son of Abinoam, this is like her military leader from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, the Lord God of Israel commands you, go with you, take 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I'll lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and I'll give him into your hands. If you get underneath this a little bit from the original language standpoint, Verse 2, where she says, the Lord, the God of Israel commands you, would be better translated, has not the Lord God commanded you? Some of your translations, depending on what you're reading from, may already have it that way. Has not the Lord commanded you? In other words, she's not giving this word for the first time to Barak. He knows exactly what he's supposed to do. Because she's already spoken it as God's messenger at least once before. She's saying, Barak, God has already spoken. Has he not made his will and his order perfectly clear? So she's doing something powerful. She is leading by standing on the word that God has spoken. There's a lot of different ways we lead. There's a lot of different places where we get our, our thoughts, our wisdom, our intellect, our, our judgment. She's using what God has plainly, clearly spoken to be her ultimate foundation. And she's confident enough in it that she will even challenge her military leader in his fear and trepidation to move forward by saying, God has spoken, therefore we will move forward. Verse 8, Barak says to her, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. This is fascinating. Even after being reminded, even after being affirmed, he is still, Barak is, he is still cowering. 
Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you're taking, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. This is a great reminder. This whole story is of the fact that God will do whatever he wants to do. However he wants or however he needs to do it. But he invites us. He invites us into his story. And he invites us in in ways where our lives have an opportunity to be woven in with the fabric of this great big story that he's telling. And he provides moments of obedience, moments of response. And many times if we say no to him, we think, well, then it won't happen. No, it's going to happen. God will make it happen however he needs to make it happen. What won't happen is you won't get to have your story connected to it. That's what Barak was learning. He'll use a woman to lead the nation of Israel. And if, the, and if his military leader won't go forward, well, he'll, he'll do it a different way then. But he's going to accomplish, God is, whatever he wants to accomplish. Verse 9, uh, God tells through, through Deborah, again, because of the course you're taking, the honor will not be yours. Then it says, for the Lord will deliver Sisera. This is the same word, deliver. It's actually the same word, sell, that was used in verse 2 when we said the Lord sold Israel to the Canaanites. Now it's being turned. And part of this restoration process that's happening is because the people have chosen to repent and they've returned to God. And when you turn back to God, God starts to change his action. And now instead of selling you, he sells your enemies out. And he turns this around. And now those who are against the people of God are about to get crushed. They head into battle. Deborah says, I'll go with you. But the glory of this battle will not belong to a man. It'll belong to a woman. Let's see how this plays out. Verse 14. The day of the battle comes, and Deborah says to Barak, Go. This is the day that the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down to Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by sword. And then Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. So from here, Sisera's on the run. And he knows he lost. And it's just self-preservation at this point. And so he runs and runs and runs for a while. He gets exhausted from all the running and, and the fighting. And he comes to kind of a Bedouin community with some, some people that previously uh, the Canaanites had made a treaty with of some kind. And he feels like because of probably the previous position of strength that he can still leverage that in this moment and use fear to make them be nice to him and honor this treaty. So he comes to the tent of this woman named J.L. Her husband's not around. He's maybe out fighting or farming or I don't know what he's doing, but she's there and he says, Hey, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, can you give me something to drink, and I need to lie down. And so, and, and if anybody comes to ask for me, you tell them, you've not seen me, I'm not here. So she obliges, and she gets him something to drink, she gives him some milk, and lets him lay down. But there's, a, there's something going on in her that's a little bit different. And the story that she's about to be a part of goes a little bit different than the way Sisera thought this was going to go. As his eyes are closing and fading into sleep from his exhaustion, look at verse 21. But Jael, Hebrew's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. And she drove the tent peg through his temple into the ground. And this is my favorite part of the verse. And he died. <laughs> you think? You think the tent peg through the temple will do it every time? It'll do it every time. I just, my, 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 my middle school brain just takes over in this story. And I just see this guy with the, with the tent peg through his head spinning around in a circle, you know, as it's just holding him there on the ground. I don't know why. 
finally, we see Barak, Israel's military leader, catch up. And this is what happens then. Just then, Barak came in by pursuit, came in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. And she says, come here, I'll show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. And on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites, through the boldness of Jael, connected to the prophecy of Deborah, prompted by her pushing the military into action because of her bold faith in God. And here's the ultimate result of all this. Chapter 5, verse 31. Then the land had peace for 40 years. After 20 years of enslavement, 20 years of turmoil, 20 years of difficulty, because of one day and one moment of boldness and courage and just fierce faith, an entire nation's fortunes for 40 years were changed. Here, here's, here's, here's how that happened. Deborah saw a moment to change the story. And she saw a moment to take this cycle that had been happening and insert ministry into it. Let me show you how this happened. Let me show you what this looks like. Here's a picture if I could just kind of draw a line and show you where she entered the story, it's right between the reckoning. It's right between the reckoning and the repentance. This is where she said, here's my moment. This is what my calling is. This is what I've been asked by God to do. People are running from God. People are rejecting God. But in this moment, I have the opportunity to be used by God to help turn hearts back to him. This is the same opportunity that you and I have. Maybe you're in that cycle and you go, that looks like my life. Rebellion, reckoning after the rebellion, and then repentance, and then eventually this restoration. And maybe you see it in a sense that today you're able to know, well, there's my next step. It's time to move towards the repentance and the restoration. Maybe for some of you, this is prompting in you a desire to be like Deborah and to help other people come out of that season of destruction and devastation and be used by God to confidently stand on his word and point to the hope that we have in a God who has infinite grace for us. And just like she did, you see your life sitting right in between those places, helping others take that next step. This reminds me of 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. It says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We, therefore, are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. You know, I heard a story about some guys that were sitting around arguing about the best Bible translation. This is an argument that people like to have. And there's, there's many different translations of the Bible uh, that, are, that are out there and, and probably even in a room like this. Many of you have your favorites. The first guy uh, says this. He says, well, the King James is the best translation of the Bible. That's how I learned it. It would go, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me, was his argument. And, uh, and, and so he, he just said, there's no other way than the King James Bible. That is the translation. And another guy said, man, I, I hear you. And after correcting him about when the King James was written, he said, I, I prefer something a little more modern. He said, I really like the New Living Translation. It's a little fresher. Um, it's not so much word for word in its translation. It's more thought for thought. It, it kind of takes in the idea that, hey, we're trying to bring language and idioms from thousands of years ago into modern language. We don't have to get every single word because it just might not all make sense. The syntax is off. Let's just get the thoughts right. What's the general sense of this verse? That's bring I like the New Living Translation. It speaks to me in my language. Another guy said, no. You guys are swinging the pendulums too far. Somewhere in the middle would be maybe like an, like an ESV. I like the ESV. It's a little more word for word. It's a dynamic equivalence. 
of, 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 the, tr- of, the, of the original text. That's where I want to land. The fourth guy goes, well, if you're going to go that route, let's just go word for word. You guys are throwing away uh, this idea that thought for thought is okay. Hey, I like word for word. If God's word is inspired, I want every single word. So you just put me in order, every single word translated from the original text, Hebrew or Greek, into English. I don't care if it doesn't make any sense. I don't care if the sentence structure is off. If you've ever read an NASB, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've got to diagram a sentence to try to figure out. These are all the right words, but it's like Scrabble. None of them are in the right order. What am I trying to say here? The fifth guy said, I like my mom's translation the best. Of course, all these smart guys are like, what, are you, what is your mom's translation? And he goes, uh, I, I like the way she translated every day the pages of Scripture into everyday life. She showed me what this word means. She showed me how to have a strong marriage, how to be a good parent, how to lead at home, how to, how to have integrity, how to have character, how to make decisions, how to handle temptation. I like my mom's translation the best. She translated into everyday life. I think that's what Deborah is a picture of. She's a picture of someone who's translating God's word into everyday life, showing us a picture of the big idea that God is in a restoration process, that he is reaching out even right now to redeem and to restore and to renew our lives Maybe our lives have been characterized more by rebellion and this reckoning for sin that just keeps showing up. But there's a better way. There's greater good. There's a hope that's out there in front of us. There's justice in this story with Deborah. But there's also great mercy. And that's what Jesus came to show us. All these figures who have a fierce faith in the Bible are all pointing us to the ultimate picture, and that is of Jesus. He was both just and the one who justified. He was one who gave and brought punishment for sin and the one who said, punish me, and I'll take it on myself. Where this story separates a little bit, though, is where in, in Deborah's story, where Jael drove the tent peg through the temple of the enemy, in Jesus' story, he allows them to drive the pegs through his hands and through his feet. And he gives his life. Rather than take someone's and crush them that way, he does it by laying down his life. That was a payment. That was a payment. That was a judgment. That was where we were supposed to be. That was in our place. That was because we constantly, just like Israel, rebel. And even though God has spoken plainly and clearly, and even though we know he's the one true God, we start that process over again. We begin to rebel. We begin to run away from him. You know, this history, in this history of the judges, 330 years that Israel was in this era, they were enslaved. Listen to how many years they were enslaved. By the Mesopotamians, eight years. By the Moabites, 18 years. By the Canaanites, 20 years. By the Midianites, seven. By the Ammonites, 18 years. By the Philistines, 40. When you add it all up, of the 330 years, they were enslaved 111 of them. They lost a third of their life to this rebellion against God. A third of their history is marked by this rejection of, of God as king over their heart. And what do they have to show for it? Only heartache. Only heartache. So we get a chance to read this and to be reminded and maybe even connect some dots in our own life that when we want to run from God, he lets us run. He will sell us and allow us to do that. But it's always so that we come to a place where in that reckoning and in that difficulty and that suffering, we realize This is all because of the choices I've made. I can turn and return to God. And when I do, I experience restoration far greater than I could have ever imagined. God sent his deliverer in Jesus to do even more than what Deborah could do, even more than what any military could do. He came to rescue our heart, to save our souls. 
and to connect us to him for all of eternity. So it's for that that we give him praise. And it's to that that I call you to respond today, to break this cycle of rebellion, to begin the process of restoration by saying yes to Jesus. Maybe for you, this is a first-time decision to say yes to Jesus. If you want to do that today, I encourage you as we sing these next songs, come meet me in the back. If you're online, we've got hosts reaching out right now, giving you opportunities to respond. Maybe there's a decision that's in your life, or maybe there's a, a season of rebellion that's going on right now. And what saying yes to Jesus means, you've made a decision in the past, but right now you're in a season of rebellion. Maybe it's as you hear him call today, you say yes, and you return to him. You let go of everything that's entangling, and you run fully and totally and completely to him. I'm going to invite you to do that as we come to this time of response. Will you stand with me? And will you join me in a word of prayer before we get ready to worship? Heavenly Father, God, we give this uh, time to you. And we ask, God, that you would draw near to us, that we would, in this time, be reminded of how deep your love is for us. And God, that you would show us tangibly that next step. We want to say yes to you fully and completely. We want to give you everything you're asking of for us. We want to experience that restoration. May we do that today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.